Hi, welcome back to Educator. We're going to talk today about organic synthetic strategies. Now that we know a lot about organic synthetic tran uh, organic transformations that we're capable of, how do we apply those to building specific target molecules? So the goal of a synthesis is uh, the synthesis of a target molecule. So if you ever see the letters TM, that's what it's referring to. That's the, the goal, the um, organic compound we're trying to prepare. And the way that we typically uh, approach a problem like this is we start by looking at the target molecule and dissecting it, thinking about what disconnections we can make, how can we break it down, uh, and that process is described as performing a retrosynthesis. The goal is to use commercially available starting materials, so we want to keep working backwards to get simpler and simpler starting materials until finally we have something that we know we can acquire commercially, uh, hopefully inexpensively. And what we're going to do is we're going to use known functional group interconversions. So we, we know about reductions that, are, we're, that are, are possible and oxidations, eliminations, substitutions, the kinds of reactions we've seen. So we're going to use reactions that we're familiar with. And in order to do that, what, when we do our retrosynthesis and our disconnections, what we're going to be looking for are recognizable nucleophiles and electrophiles. Nucleophiles are the electron donors, electrophiles are the electron acceptors, and we're going to be looking for ones that we've seen before that are familiar to us. So for example, if this is my target molecule, I wanted to make this nitrile, uh, and I wanted to plan what is a way that I could synthesize this compound, I'm going to perform a retrosynthesis. Now we use this special arrow, this double-lined arrow refers to, a it's called a retrosynthetic arrow, and it asks the question, what starting materials do I need? So in other words, we're, we're asking, what could I have started with and using a reaction that we're familiar with in order to create, synthesize this carbon structure? Okay, and a, what we're going to be looking for in this case is a, a good disconnection. In other words, what bond was likely to have been formed in the, in the synthesis reaction? And it's probably going to be this carbon-carbon bond is the most likely one that we can start with because we have this functional group here, the cyano group, and that, that is a functional group that we can add in. So if we look at these two carbons that are involved, that are, we're going to be forming a new carbon-carbon bond to form this product, we have to recognize that as the starting materials, one of those carbons must have been a nucleophile, one of those carbons was the electrophile. That's the only way those two are going to come together and form a bond. So if we remember the cyano group, we've seen the cyano group as cyanide, CN minus. So we could say that this carbon was the nucleophile, which means somehow this carbon was the electrophile. So one thing we can do is we can simply break that bond, and at each, we're just going to erase that bond, and at each position we're going to put a charge that's associated with uh, uh, being a nucleophile or electrophile. So to be a nucleophile, the electron donor, I have a negative charge, and to be an electrophile, one thing you could do is put a positive charge there. Now, this first step is, uh, one possible step that we're doing here, is to create what's known as synthons. Now, these are imaginary structures um, that have the, the, the perfect reactivity. In other words, if I had this carbocation and this cyanide nucleophile, clearly they would come together and form the bond to make our target molecule. <clears throat> and in some cases, the synthons are um, recognizable and reasonable uh, reagents we can use. So in other words, cyanide is a stable anion. We could simply purchase sodium cyanide and use that as a nucleophile. But this carbocation uh, is an impossible reagent to use. You can't go to the stock room and ask for a carbocation, even if it's a stable carbocation. Carbocations are just fleeting intermediates. And so, um, <clears throat> not stable reagents. So we need to ask, well, what is the compound, the stable organic molecule, that has the reactivity of this carbocation? We have a four carbon chain, and on this end carbon, we want it to be electrophilic. We want it to be electron deficient. Well, a lot of times what we can do, uh, the approach we're going to take, is we can add a leaving group. And so, for example, if I put on a bromine or a chlorine or something like that, or an iodide, now we have a, an alcoholide, a, a recognizable, stable electrophile. It's got a leaving group, and that is something that would be attractive and could react with the cyanide. And what reaction do you think would happen here? <clears throat> Let's look at our synthesis. Now that we've planned it, 
That's called the retrosynthesis. This is all the imaginary planning we're doing. Just like if you're planning a road trip from uh, New York to LA, you don't just hop in the car and go. You first look it up, you plan, you plan your trip, and then you can take the trip. So what we've done is we've planned our synthesis with the retrosynthesis, and now we can perform the synthesis. We said we need butyl bromide, and we're going to treat this with sodium cyanide. And what reaction is going to happen there? Sodium cyanide, of course, is a source of CN minus, and it looks like we have perfect conditions for backside attack, SN2. Attack the carbon, kick off the leaving group, and voila, we have our target molecule. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be analyzing various target molecules based on the functional groups present, and we're going to be looking for reasonable reactions, reasonable disconnections, reasonable inter interconversions we can do uh, that will give that target molecule as a product. <clears throat> and we're going to study one functional group at a time. So for example, if we wanted to synthesize an alcohol, what we want to ask is, is what reactions have we seen that give alcohols as products? Okay, one way we can do that, one, many reactions we've seen, are called functional group interconversions, or FGIs for short. In other words, not changing the carbon chain at all, just swapping out one functional group for another. So for example, we've seen that if we want to make a, an alcohol, so if this is our target molecule, and we can think of several different retrosynthesis. Remember, this retrosynthesis arrow asks, what starting materials do I need? So we're imagining, what reaction have I seen? What could I have started with that could be converted into an alcohol? So for example, we've seen that if you have a carbonyl, uh, that could be converted to an alcohol. That looks like a reduction reaction because I started with two CO bonds, now I have only one CO bond. And um, what kind of reagent would do that? So if I had this ketone and I wanted to convert it to the alcohol, the reagents I would need would be something like maybe lithium aluminum hydride followed by workup. <clears throat> so a hydride source would convert a carbonyl to an alcohol. So that's one way we can make an alcohol. Another way we can make an alcohol is to start with an alkene. If we have an alkene and we added water across the pi bond, so hydration of the alkene, that would also give an alcohol product. And there are uh, many different hydration uh, conditions we have for that. Or maybe we could do a substitution. In other words, if we have a leaving group already on the carbon chain, then we can replace that leaving group with a hydroxyl group. So let's look at these one by one. So uh, if we have uh, any kind of carbonyl, a ketone or an aldehyde, or any one of the carboxylic acid derivatives, <clears throat> well, not all the carboxylic acid derivatives, but if we have an, an ester or an acid or an anhydride or an acid chloride, most of the carboxylic acid derivatives, if we treat it with lithium aluminum hydride, that's a source of H minus, and that H minus, of course, is going to attack the carbonyl and break the pi bond. So after workup, we're going to end up with uh, an, an alcohol. So let's look at the ketone case. That would give us a secondary alcohol because this carbon bearing the OH has two carbon groups on it. If we started with an aldehyde, that would give us a primary alcohol because there's only one carbon group attached to the carbon. And if we start with a carboxylic acid derivative, remember what happens with a carboxylic acid derivative when hydride attacks, it, it breaks the pi bond, but rather than stay at that O minus, we get a charged tetrahedral intermediate, the CTI, that collapses, kicks back down, and kicks off the uh, leaving group. Carboxylic acid derivatives have leaving groups. So we do an addition elimination reaction, and then uh, hydride can add a second time. So what we end up with is the addition of two equivalents of hydride added. And we, ended up, we end up with a uh, primary alcohol again. Okay, so just a review of the some of the various reactions we've seen that lead to alcohol products. We could start with a more oxidized form of carbon, ketone, aldehyde, carboxylic acid, and then reduce it. Now, if we wanted to hydrate an alkene, uh, we've seen several different methods for that. One is simple addition of H3O+. So that's going to break the pi bond. It's going to add an H and an OH, the components of water across the pi bond. And we learned about the regiochemistry of that. Remember Markovnikov's rule? Markovnikov's rule says that the hydrogen goes to the carbon with more hydrogens. And so the product we would expect would be 
the more substituted alcohol. So we call that Markovnikov addition. Because when we do our synthesis, we have to make sure that the synthesis is occurring with the proper regiochemistry to put the functional groups exactly where we want them. And an alkene has two carbons that are reactive. We want the alcohol to be in only one of those positions. <clears throat> Now this mechanism involves a, a carbocation, and remember carbocations can rearrange and we can have some other issues uh, going on, so uh, this H3O plus conditions are not suitable for all um, alkenes, a hydration of alkenes. So another one we could do, this is called oxymercuration reduction or oxymercuration demercuration, and this, uh, this synthesis, this two-step procedure is just a more controlled way to do the same transformation, a Markovnikov addition of water across the pi bond. So that's a, synthetically, that's a little better, um, you know, more reliable technique to use rather than just acid and water. And then you remember this one, this is called hydroboration oxidation. Hydroboration oxidation, what was special about this reaction, this two-step sequence, is that it added water, but it did it in anti-Markovnikov orientation. So we, uh, we add the hydrogen to the, less, to the carbon with less hydrogens and the OH to the other end. So this is very nice synthetically because now we have tools uh, to, to control our regiochemistry and add the alcohol uh, in, in, to one carbon or the other and get a few different target molecules as a result.